Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Glad to have you all here. The uh, regular announcer, Brian Minnick, is not here today, so I can get called into this place. He usually tells that by Joe. The only story I know about Easter that was that, uh, that was funny was um, we used to celebrate Palm Sunday. Remember Palm Sunday in, in the uh, church that I grew up in? And one time, um, my little brother was sick and didn't go to Palm Sunday. And we brought the palms home. We used to get the palms. And little brother says, he's probably five, says, what was, what did he get the palms for? And he said, uh, well, today is Palm Sunday. And you, you, we, uh, people put these palms in front of their eyes to see, uh, walk, walk through. And little brother says, figure, the day I'm sick, Christ comes to church. <laughs> The announcements today, um, Women's Bible Study Fellowship, as usual, uh, it, it, Bible Study on Daniel uh, is at 7 p.m. at Christie Prom's house on Tuesday night. On Thursday, the Good News Club will be at L.P. Brown Elementary at 3.45 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, the Union Gospel Mission Bible Study has been canceled for this week, and there's a Grange meeting which uh, Sean takes care of for us this Thursday at 7 p.m. So those are the uh, announcements today, and I think... Uh, Bill is going to read the, um, the Bible verses. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be today. I'm excited about Andy's lesson. And I'm going to read from John 20, verses 24 through 31. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my fingers into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see, and yet believe. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things have been written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, believing, you may have life in his name. Seeing is believing, and, and for that reason, not believing in Christ. And, and reminded of what Bill just read, and how um, Jesus Himself said, "Blessed are those who not seen and yet believe." And I ask, Lord, that You would help more people to understand that blessing, and that they would um, come to You through Christ, trusting in Him, trusting in the testimony of Your Word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. People in this town are caught in what seems like an endless cycle. Birth, life, and death. And that last one has been something that I've been reminded of these last couple weeks as there was two fatal car accidents not too far from where I live. The first one was at the back side of the housing development that 
uh, us and the Gramps live in, there was a man who may have been drinking who turned in front of a motorcycle, and the motorcyclist was killed. And the second one happened last week. It was someone driving on Rainier Road uh, that crossed the line and had a head-on collision with someone else. Both the drivers were killed. And that was actually someone I, I knew. His name was Shane. And so I've had some thoughts about that in the last couple weeks as, as these things have happened in the areas where me and my family live and drive. And we could ask, why do these things happen? Well, these things happen because God gives people freedom to make choices, and sometimes those choices affect other people. But from a purely worldly perspective, we could look at this and say, well, this is just the same cycle, the thing that always happens, birth and life and death. And without any input from God, we may be tempted to think, what, what difference does it make? What difference does any of it make? We might be tempted to give up, to not care, to stop confessing Christ and living for His glory, because this is the cycle of things, birth and life and death never changes. But I suggest that this morning we ask ourselves a different question, a question that affects our lives right now, and that is, what difference does the resurrection of Christ make in my life right now? What difference does the resurrection of Christ make in my life right now? And to consider that question, I bring your attention to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who were being tempted to give up, to go back to their old way of life, to throw in the towel. And that is a thought that occurs to all of us sometimes, and it's probably a thought that occurs to some of us more, more often than we would like to admit. And when those thoughts occur, it is essential for us to know something about the resurrection of Christ and the difference that it makes in our lives right now, because it means that there is a person, a perfect person, who is in the perfect position to intervene before God on our behalf. And that is something that the author of the book of Hebrews calls these believers' attention to in their time of desperation and need. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be considering three parts of the passage there. We have a great high priest who serves forever. We have a great high priest who always lives to intercede. And we have a great high priest who is perfect. What we will be emphasizing today is that the resurrection means that we have someone to intercede for us. Resurrection and intercession. This is how the resurrection of Christ makes a difference in our lives right now. It meets us right in our time of need, right up to this moment. It matters now. As I was praying earlier when, when Bill read that passage from John, I thought of so many people today that might be tempted to say, seeing is believing, and I can't see Christ so I don't believe in Him. What they're saying is that nothing about Him matters to me now. But the Bible says something different. It says that it does matter now. <coughs> that the resurrection of Christ matters right now. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 7 verses 20 through 22. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests without an oath, but he with an oath through the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. I think between all of us here, we probably work a lot of different kinds of jobs. And in different jobs, we've probably had several different bosses. I've had quite a few myself. Some that I liked, like the one I have right now, I actually really like. Some that I haven't liked so much. One of the things that you can get concerned about at your job is that if you have a boss that you like, or even if you have one that you don't really like that much, but at least it's not a threat to your job, you might get worried about a change in leadership. 
because a change in leadership could affect you in some way. It could affect the security of your employment. And that is why it is so encouraging that when I think about our access to God, I look at this passage and I see that we have a great high priest who serves forever. It says here, you are a priest forever. And so we never have to worry about Christ, our great high priest, changing or dying or quitting his job or getting promoted or transferred. That's not something that will happen with Jesus Christ, our great high priest. He is, a high, he is our great high priest forever. He serves in this role forever. And the author of the book of Hebrews points out at the beginning that it was not without an oath that this happened, but it was with an oath. And we might ask, what kind of oath are we talking about here? But before we get into that, before we go there, the author of Hebrews brings up this idea about an oath, and then he draws an immediate contrast, saying, for they indeed, these priests of the Old Testament, became priests without an oath. Have you ever thought about the process for becoming a priest in the Old Testament? Well, they didn't have, like, an application for it. Uh, they didn't even have social security numbers, but it was pretty intense. Take a look with me at this table that I've summarized from Exodus 29. So here's what they would go through. In Exodus 29, and it's repeated in Leviticus, they would first prepare sacrifices. God commanded Moses when he was ordaining Aaron and his sons as the first high priest, Aaron, and the first priests, that they would begin by preparing sacrifices. And then to be a priest, you had to be Aaron, or one of his sons. It was not open to all of Israel. It was not even open to all of the Levites. But you had to be part of this specific family. And then they would go and they would wash at the doorway, the tent of meeting. And they would wear special clothing. All of these things, by the way, this summary, all of these steps, the clothing, the sacrifices, the anointing oil, were very specific steps that had great care involved with each one of them. I want to read to you concerning the special clothing, but especially concerning the anointed, the anointing oil, I want to read to you from Exodus chapter 30 to explain how involved each one of these steps is. Each step has steps that have to be taken before you can take that step. Exodus chapter 30, starting in verse 23. Starting in verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take also for yourself the finest of spices, of flowing myrrh, 500 shekels, and of fragrant cinnamon, half as much, 250, and of fragrant cane, 250, and of cassia, 500, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil, a hen. You shall make of these a holy anointing oil, a perfume mixture, the work of a perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering and all of its utensils and the laver and the stand. You shall also consecrate them, and they shall be, and they and they may, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them shall be holy. You shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister as priests to me. You shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout my, your generations. It shall not be poured on anybody, on anyone's body, nor shall you make any like it in the same proportions. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever shall mix any like it, or whoever puts any of it on a layman, shall be cut off from his people. So you can see that each one of these steps here for becoming a priest had other steps that had to be taken before they could be taken. We had the special clothing, special oil, and then there was a series of offerings, a sin offering, and a burnt offering, and a wave offering. It was called the ram of ordination. And not only this, but there was a seven-day process. Each day, there had to be a sin offering, a bowl. So this was something that, that took time. And surprisingly, as you read through Exodus 29 and other passages that talk about the qualifications to become a, great, or a high priest, in the Old Testament, not among them, was an oath. There was no oath. There was no oath of office that we would think of. 
When we think of an oath of office today, I think that we especially think of the presidency or Congress. Let me read to you from Article 2, Section 1, Clause 8 of the Constitution. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So the priests in the Old Testament did not become priests with an oath. And yet, the oath that we're talking about is not really like this one either, because this is an oath of office that someone takes when they enter into the office to be faithful to their duties. But the oath that is made here, that the author of Hebrews speaks about, is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. And it's not an oath that Jesus took in order to become the great high priest, but it's an oath that God the Father swore. Look back at Psalm 110. It's up on the board there as well. Psalm 110. This is where the author of Hebrews is quoting from. And he's and it says there, this is the Psalm of David, Psalm 110, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And when we read those words, we see that we're reading a correspondence between two members of the Trinity. And as we read them, our ears should buzz with excitement as we understand the divine communication that's taking place. And I call your attention to the verse that says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. And I ask you, who did the swearing? Who swore the oath? The priests in the Old Testament did not become priests with an oath from God or from them. And this isn't an oath of office either, but it's God who swore. God the Father swearing an oath that the Son would be a priest forever. The author of Hebrews quotes this several times. And it says, again, I call your attention to where it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. The Greek word for change your mind there is the word that is most often translated repent. That's why that's one reason why in this church we insist that uh, the word repent means to change one's mind. But in any case, this was not an oath of office. It was not like what we would think of it as. It's not an oath that the Old Testament priests took, but it was how Jesus became a priest with this oath from God. And notice that the result is different too. He is a priest forever, never being transferred or promoted or changed. We can draw great confidence from this fact that when we go to approach God in our time of need, it's always the same way because Jesus is our great high priest, who is our great high priest forever. The old priests were the sons of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, and that, that priesthood was based on the old covenant. That's the Old Testament. The law in the Old Testament. But this was better than that because it was based on an oath made from God the Father. And he himself becomes the guarantee for a better covenant. Of that better covenant, I'd like to read, from, read to you from Hebrews chapter 8. You might ask, what is this better covenant? But Hebrews chapter 8 Verses 7 through 13 is a quotation from the Old Testament, Jeremiah. And it, it quotes the details of this new covenant that was predicted in the Old Testament. It says there, verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And so we can see there the details of this new covenant. The word covenant means contract. And this contract is with Israel and Judah. It's a covenant. It's a contract. So many people today want to change that contract and say, well, this contract's really with the church. That's kind of like me coming up to someone in our church and saying, hey, you know how you're married to her? Well, now you're married to her. Is that how that works? No. You can't just change a covenant contract. You can't just change a marriage covenant like that. Neither can we change a covenant that's found in the Old Testament. But what we see here is that this covenant is made with Israel, and it will happen in the future. And Jesus is the guarantee of that covenant. And the blessing for us is that although the church is not named as a party in that covenant, we get to share in some of the benefits of it today, particularly Jesus Christ, high priesthood, that we are able to avail ourselves of today. The resurrection of Jesus means that he is alive to intercede for us, and we can draw near to him today, right now. In this moment, we can come to God through Jesus Christ. Moving on to verses 23 through 25, let's read there about our great high priest who always lives to intercede. It says, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So the former priests died, but this great high priest lives forever to intercede. The former priests died no matter how famous, no matter how important they were, no matter what role they served in, they could not serve forever. I draw your attention to Numbers 27. Speaking of the death of Aaron, at this point in the Old Testament, God had commanded Moses to, to take Aaron up on Mount Or, and he was going to die there because he was identified with the sinful Exodus generation, and he would not be allowed to enter into the promised land. Reading from there, it says, So Moses did just as the Lord had commanded, and they went up to Mount Or, in the sight of all the congregation. After Moses had stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eliezer, Aaron died there on the mountaintop. Then Moses and Eliezer came down from the mountain. When all the congregation saw that Aaron had died, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron for 30 days. And this was the same with all of the Old Testament priests. They died. And another of the sons of Aaron took their place. The historian Josephus, the Jewish historian, numbered 83 high priests from the time that the priesthood began to the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. And you can think, you can think about the most famous person that you know, maybe the most famous priest that you know, or anyone that you know. You got him in your mind? You thinking about who might it be? And I can just tell you, that person cannot help you right now like Jesus can. He is in a perfect position. He is the perfect person to help us in a way that is different than anyone else. And so Jesus is not limited in this way. He's not limited by death. He's not prevented by death from continuing in his service. This is the difference of the resurrection. He broke that cycle, that cycle of death, and, or of birth and life and death. That cycle was broken by him because after he died for our sins on the cross, he came back to life, never to die again. When he was resurrected, it was forever. He conquered death forever. And, and this means he's available to you right now. He's available to you in a way that no one in the past could ever be. Because they're dead. And he's not. The resurrection means that Jesus is alive forever to intercede for us. We can draw near to God through him. And especially this truth is apparent in 
Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Starting there, I read it to you again. It says, Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And why does he always live to make intercession for us? It's because he is resurrected. Because he is resurrected never to die again. Now it says here that he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. That could be translated and is more effectively translated save to the uttermost. That word there for forever is a uh, in my notes here, Pantelis. And it's used in Luke chapter 13, verse 11. I'm going to read that to you. Turn there if you would. Luke chapter 13, verse 11. There it's talking about a woman who had a sickness. And in that verse it says, There was a woman who, had, who for 18 years has, had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. Or really what it means is she could not straighten up all the way. So she was bent over like this and she couldn't straighten her back up all the way. Well that word, to straighten up all the way, that's our same word here. Where it says, therefore he is able to save forever. And so instead of the word forever referring to time, what I'm saying is that it refers in instead to completion. Jesus is able to save completely to the uttermost, thoroughly. And this kind of salvation is not referring to our past salvation or justification, but it's referring to the present salvation and Jesus being able to carry us all the way safely to the end through his great high priesthood, which is something that we can access right now. I told you that the author of Hebrews wrote to a group of people who were tempted to give up. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are times where we're tempted to give up. And if we are ever tempted in such a way, there is no more important ministry that we could possibly know or understand than this ministry of Christ right now. His high priesthood means that we can come to God through Him in the present, at this moment, right now, and take advantage of the deliverance that He offers. If we can think of it in terms of history, in Jesus' earthly ministry, before he went to the cross, he was a prophet. And when he went to the cross, and from that time on, he is our high priest. And when he returns, after the rapture of the church and after the tribulation, when he returns to this earth, he will come as a conquering king. Prophet, high priest, ruling king. And that means that we should never be discouraged in this life to the point that we would give up, but instead we can understand, we can draw near to God through Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, which describes to us in a similar way how we can draw near to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. It says there, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence or boldness to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus can never be killed, he can never be stopped, he can never be prevented, he never becomes unavailable. Your access to him is not dependent on your cell phone service. He lives forever to intercede for you. What is intercession? Intercession is intervention. It means that he intervenes to God on our behalf. And that does not mean that Jesus there at the, at the throne of grace when, when when Satan calls to God's attention and accuses us that we've sinned in some way, it does not mean that Jesus needs to throw himself down and beg God to not punish us. But what it does mean is that his presence there, seated at the right hand of God, is a living testimony to the fact that our sins are paid for. 
He paid the penalty. He's our priest. He's also the sacrifice. His presence there is intervention for us. It's a living testimony that what he did satisfied the Father. And he's available in this capacity. So we should avail ourselves of this ministry of his by drawing near to God through Christ in faith. And I'm not talking about justification, although that is also true that at the time that we first believe in Christ, the first time that we ever come to Christ for salvation, to be forgiven from the penalty of our sins, we come to Him in faith. What I'm saying is that every time additional to that time, we come to God through Christ in faith. Not for salvation from hell, because there's no need for that anymore. That was accomplished the first time that we came to God through Christ in faith. But now we need deliverance from the power of sin in our lives. And how do we find that deliverance? Where do we go? It's not different than the first time that we trust in Christ. It is the same. We come to God through Christ, our great high priest, in faith. In faith. Where else do we find this kind of unending faithfulness? Well, as I was thinking about it, um, it reminded me of a song. So I'm going to play that song for you now. Son, 
made perfect forever. And so we could ask ourselves, what kind of high priest is Jesus? And the author of Hebrews says that he is a fitting or a proper high priest. And when I think about that, I think, well, here you have Jesus, who's, uh, as, as the text said, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. And I think, well, how is he a fitting high priest for me? Because I'm a sinner, and I don't deserve a great high priest like that. But that's why I need one. That's why I need one. And really, a high priest isn't for one party, but for two. Look back at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. And it says there, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And so what is the job of a high priest? If you're appointed as a high priest on behalf of people. So you represent those people to God. And when I think about that, I think, oh, that makes more sense. It's not that I deserve such a wonderful and perfect high priest, but that I need one to represent me before God. And as far as representing me before God, there could never be anyone better than the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the perfect representative for me. It says that he is holy. That's set apart in cleanness to God's purposes. Innocent, blameless, unlike the Old Testament high priests who have their own sins. Undefiled, he's not touched by the moral corruption of man. Separated from sinners, he's not like any one of us. That's why I think so many people struggle to trust in Christ. Someone told me recently, well, he was just a guy. He's just like us. Well, he's a guy that claimed to be God, so he can't be just like us, because then you end up saying, well, either he was really God, or he was crazy, or he was a liar. He can't really be just like us, even for just that claim. That's what people think. They think he was just, he was a great man. He was an important man, but he's just like us. But no, he's not just like us, and that's why he's the perfect representative before God. For us. Think about this uh, in, in terms of sacrifices. This is one way that Jesus was different. In the Old Testament, the high priest's primary service was to offer sacrifices. And we saw that in Exodus 29 when, when we had that table up earlier. You could see that all the sacrifices that needed to happen just so a person could become a great high priest or a high priest or a priest. All of those sacrifices. The, the three, the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the wave offering, the ram of ordination, which needed to be eaten uh, on that evening, and what was, whatever was left over was destroyed. And then every day, for seven days, they would offer a sin offering. All those sacrifices, just so you could become a high priest, and then what was your job when you became a high priest? To offer sacrifices. So they had to offer, offer sacrifices, not only for their own sins, but also for the sins of the people. They offered sacrifices on behalf of the people. And these sacrifices, the physical sacrifices, the, the blood of lambs and, and bulls, these things could not take away sin. They did not take away sin. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse 1. For the law since it was only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins, year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, speaking of Christ, he says, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. And that was the will of God, that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would take the penalty for sin on our behalf. And it was his sacrifice that was effectual. 
All of those sacrifices beforehand were merely symbolizing what the Messiah would do in reality. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. They offered sacrifices that could not remove sin. But what did Jesus do that was different? He was the high priest who offered himself. No other high priest has ever done that. He was the offering. And in addition to this, they offered the sacrifices daily, often, over and over. It had to be repeated again and again, year by year. But he did it once. One time, he offered up himself, and it was sufficient. It was all that was needed. Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. And he only needed to die for our sins one time. It's called the finished work of Christ when he was on the cross dying for our sins. He said that. It is finished. It is paid for. He died as our substitute. He died in our place. He took the penalty that you and I deserve to pay and put it on himself. And he bore away our sins as the Lamb of God. That is grace. He is the only high priest who has ever been the sacrifice. And so he is our great high priest who is perfect, so much more perfect than those given by the law, the law of Moses. And the last verse here contrasts the law and the oath. Reading it again, it says, For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. So the Old Testament law appointed human priests from among sinful humanity. But later on, when that oath came, in Psalm 110, God the Father swore and appointed the Son of God, who is the perfect high priest. And it says he was made perfect. What does that mean? Well, he is the Son of God, and so he is God, and he is perfect for that reason. That it is true that he is perfect in holiness. But what this refers to is the process by which he became high priest. Because in eternity past, before the Son of God took on human flesh, before he became Jesus and received the name Jesus, before he became a human being, he did not serve as our great high priest in eternity past. He took this position by becoming identified with humanity. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, which explains more about this. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. It says there, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. <coughs> for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Jesus, it says there, was perfected through sufferings. That means that he was prepared to be this high priest in his humanity through sufferings. And reading on in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 through 18. It says there, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he, also, which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So Jesus suffered, not for his own sin, of which he had none, and he was tested. And this was not to prove that he could fail, but to prove that he could not fail. He was tested as a man and made the perfected representative of mankind before God. His testing was greater than ours, and he succeeded. He was perfected for this role as high priest through sufferings. And that's not to imply in any way that Jesus was not perfect before, but it was demonstrated that he could not fail. And we can understand now at this time that we can draw near to God through him because Jesus understands what it is to be tested. This is what the resurrection means. It means that Jesus is alive forever. He always lives to intercede for us, and we can draw near to God through him. 
and that can happen for anyone, an unbeliever who has never trusted in Christ, they can draw near to God through Jesus Christ, receiving the free gift of salvation, believing that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. But that's not really what this passage is about. It's about people who have already trusted in Christ, availing ourselves of the high priesthood of Christ, understanding that as we're tempted and as we're discouraged and depressed, as we go through sufferings and we're tempted to give up, that we can draw near to God through Christ, who understands what it is to be tested. And that is one of the applications. What are some ways that we can apply this text? When you feel like giving up, perhaps the most important thing that you could remember is the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He is available for you now and always. In the present, this ministry is available to you. One day he will come as the conquering king. But for now, it is his high priestly ministry that is able to have an impact on the present. When you feel like giving up, that is true. When you feel inadequate, remember that you have a perfected representative before God that understands what it means to be tested. Jesus understands. Someone asked me this week at work, do you ever feel inadequate? I said, all the time. All the time. But I never feel like Jesus is inadequate. And because of that, I have confidence. And that's the last application. When you aren't confident... Know that you can be confident before God because of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 said to come boldly before the throne of grace. Boldly before the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How can we come boldly before God when we're sinners and He is perfect? The Almighty. We can do that because of Jesus. Because of what He did for us. We can be confident before God. And that translates to confidence before others. At the end of this service today, we'll read from Hebrews chapter 10, the final word of encouragement. And I encourage you, as we read that, to think about how that confidence before God, because of Christ's high priestly ministry, can translate into confidence before people as we hold forth our testimony, this unique testimony that Jesus has died for our sins and risen from the dead. And because he has risen from the dead, things are different right now. Let's pray together, and then we'll sing one last hymn. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this ministry of Jesus Christ, and we confess that we need it all the time. We thank you for making us aware of it, for granting us this access to you through him, and I pray that as often as we need it, that we will be reminded through your Holy Spirit, to take advantage of this amazing offer to come to you through him for deliverance as we face temptations and persecutions and marginalization and other things like that. Please help us to be alert to that and to respond as you direct us here. May I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I have to uh, switch the uh, the PowerPoint so we can sing the last hymn. So just give me a second. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and stand.
together.